Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dice Tower. My name is Z Garcia. And I'm Camilla. Today we are taking a look at three games that are spin-offs from other previous games. We're taking a look at Tucana Builders, uh, even though there's already a uh, Trails of Tucana game. We are taking a look at My Shelfie, the dice game. I'll let you guess what this comes from. And then we are taking a look at Kinfire Delve, Vainglory's Grotto, uh, in the same world as Kinfire Chronicles. So we're going to be diving into each of these, giving you our thoughts. Let's take a look at Tucana Builders here, which is a much bigger game uh, than the game it comes from, Trails of Tucana. That was a much smaller box, a little uh, sort of flip and write style game. And this is a tile laying game. So uh, form factor much larger, more components, way more components in it. Uh, is the game very different? What does this one feel like? We're not really going to be comparing these to the game they come from. We're just taking this on its own merits. So let's go ahead and take a look at how it works. We'll come on back. We'll tell you what we think of it. The game is going to be played over two rounds of 12 turns each. And in each one of those turns, you are going to reveal a card. Everyone draws a tile randomly and you're going to place that tile somewhere on your own personal board that matches that landscape. So I might, for example, put that tile there. Once everyone's done, we reveal the next one and so on until we go through 12 cards here. Then we are going to score. We'll shuffle up these 12 cards and do it one more time. Then we're ready for end game scoring. One time per round, you can, after a card is flipped, you can instead flip face down this wild card that you have and ignore the landscape. And then you'll get this back for round two, so you can do that twice in the game as well. For scoring, you are going to check three uh, the, the three colors present, the yellow huts, and you'll check every leopard and every toucan connected to your yellow huts. Same thing for red here, and same thing for blue. You'll notice the toucans are always wild for all three colors. Having done that and scored a various amount of victory points, we then go through the second round. You do it again, you'll score some victory points. And then we do final scoring, which is going to entail writing down all those scores and then also writing down your lowest score again. So you will score your lowest again, uh, which is going to incentivize you to keep them all moving along at the same rate. If you want to, you can choose to play with the uh, included variant, which is revealing two of these special conditions. And the first person to achieve one of them is going to get the higher victory points. Anybody else who does it will get the lower one. And you would score that down here as well. Whoever has the highest score, of course, is the winner of the game. There's a few different games that do this whole call out of things. They're sort of bingo-esque mm -hmm. games. You call out a thing and then everybody will make that mark or do that thing on their own board. Unfortunately for me, I think this one has one very serious, very fatal flaw. And that is, while the type of land you call is the same, you draw a random tile. Yes. And you place that tile on that landscape. Now you have options, early in the game especially, of where it could go. You know, that land type is out there a few times. But if the tile and the landscape just don't line up, they just don't line up. Right, to the point that the further you go in the game, the more punishing it becomes. Yeah. Um, I think in one of the plays, you actually uh, made the comment, I think, that it feels like the frustration of Calico. Yes. You know, without being the puzzle of Calico, because yes. you're just responding. You're like, I don't know, I guess I'll put myself in this corner and this corner. Oh, and why not stub my toe and put myself in this corner too? Yes. <laughs> you know, it just felt like so much more punishing. Uh, when things line up, it's because the stars aligned and the angels started singing at the right moment. You or, know, it's, or like, they it's don't, just and luck. You just feel like crap. Yeah, it's one of the yeah. few games that I consistently, when I play, feel worse the longer the game goes on. You and it's a short game too. It's like two rounds, 12 cards. Like literally you take 24 very quick turns in this game. Right, you stop caring the longer the game goes. Yeah. You know, to where it's like, it's almost comical and you laugh about how comical it is rather than getting excited about that turn that matters. I definitely felt as I was playing this, it was begging to be a roll and write. 
or a flip and write or whatever you call it, right. you know, which I haven't played the original, but I think given the bigger box size, my expectation was a little bit more, maybe a little bit more traditional board game. And it did not. This felt like an oversized flip and write that just kind of led to some frustrations. There was quite a few things I did like about it. I do like that, um, such as Karuba, you have one thing that matches. In Karuba, you get the same tile that you're trying to play, so it really is you adapting to the tile. Right. Everyone has the same stuff to pull from. This one, you have the same land types. Right. But then it, it can happen multiple times where you're like, I got another little tight corner that doesn't work anywhere. And, you know, this other person's frustrated because they get nothing but the big multi-connection things, and they're wasting half the connections. And so it just, it, it's almost there. It's almost there, but it just didn't live up to that expectation. It, it wants to be its smaller, its younger brother still. Yeah, and I think I, I thought the same thing, but for me it was, this would be so much better as an app where they score for me mm. and the board isn't so bright that I can't discern. Like, it's just so, like, when the tiles, you don't fill in the whole board by the end of the game. Um, so there's still landscapes that yeah. are sort of showing through. And it's just such a visual mess. That's a good that point. The background is just not faded at all. There's no good no good reason why it's so bright. Mm -hmm. I don't need to check that stuff once I've covered it. You know what I mean? Or like I, I look for them one time and then I don't care what, what the background was. If it's jungle or whatever. Fade that stuff away. As an app that would score for me, I mean, automatically I'd be like, yeah, sure. It'll take five minutes tops to play. But as it is in this form factor for me, and this breaks my heart because I like this company, I like these designers, I like the first one quite a bit. This is just a serious misstep. It's a serious miscalculation of, I guess, what people want. In my opinion, uh, this is going to get a 4 out of 10 for me. I really disliked it. I didn't quite dislike it. I had a hard time going that far as to say, but I, I'm going to come in at a five. Um, I guess I think it just still wanted to be what the base, not the base game, but the original uh, inspiration for the game was. It just, it wants to be a flip and right, but it's not quite there. Whether it's, you know, going and taking that next step and going to an app where the paths as they connect, you know, would become brighter and the other stuff would fade away. You know, if they're doing something graphically like that, if they're cleaning up the scoring, there's just adding a little bit more flexibility and mitigation, you know, maybe a redraw of a tile or some mechanism where you can overbuild on a tile late game, you know, something like that, some little asymmetry. It just, for a box this size, kind of being the next in line in this, it needed a little bit, a little bit more for me. So it's a five. I didn't hate it, but um, I, I'm okay when it's over. Yeah, yeah. So there you go. That is uh, Tucana Builders. That is pretty much a pass for both of us. Let's take a look now at a My Shelfie the Dice game here. This is a, uh, a roll and write in which you are going to be, I guess thematically you're stacking things on your shelf. This is a spin-off of My Shelfie, which was sort of a tongue-in-cheek game about stacking games on your shelves. Uh, in this one you've got and I don't know if the original one did or not because I haven't played it, but this one's got cats and car uh, and, and books and board games, plants, trophies, different categories of things. You're rolling dice Yahtzee style, circling things you are com completing, collecting, and then scoring those things. Let me go ahead and show you very briefly what the game looks like on the table. We'll come on back. We'll discuss our thoughts. In the game, each player is going to get one of these boards and a dry erase marker. There are six dice that the players are going to share. Before I explain how the game operates, let me make one distinction very clear, and that is the difference between a mark, which is a circle in one of the spaces, and an elimination, which is an X through a space, all right? So remember that. These are marks. These are eliminations. That's going to matter later on. During the game, you're going to be making marks on the board here, trying to uh, get every line, every shelf, and every column to ideally have at least three marks, because every shelf and every column will not score at all, unless there are at least three marks, three of those circles, or more. On your turn, you're going to take all of these dice, you're going to roll them up to three times. After a single roll, you can keep whatever you want, you can re-roll, and you can re-roll one more time. Let's say I end up with this. 
Uh, then I may transfer from these dice up to three marks over to my board. So I could take, say, this group here of three, and I could, looking at column three right here, I could make a mark there. And perhaps I want this one as well, so it'll be in column one, and perhaps this one which will go here in column one as well. Again, only three marks at most. I could even choose to split something up. So I could have done one here with the meeples, a two, and then perhaps just that one. Those could have been my three marks. Uh, and again, I can make up to three. I have to make at least one or I need to eliminate some things, all right? So that's how that's going to work. And then the next player will go and they will do the same thing. They can roll up to three times. They take whatever they want to and so on around the table. If at any point in the game I complete a row, a shelf, or a column with marks, so let's say I complete this shelf here with marks, then every other player is going to have to take their own sheet and eliminate every space still available to them on the same area, on the same shelf, or in the same column. Once two of the shelves have been completed, meaning all the way across, one of these being a shelf, and uh, two of those have symbols in every space, either marks or eliminations, then we're going to finish out the round. One player is the starting player in the game that will mark this box to remember that, in fact. So we keep going until the player to their right, so everyone has had the same number of turns, and then we are going to score everyone. So again, in order to score, you need to have at least three marks in a shelf to score that shelf right here, or in a column to score that column. So taking a look at that and the numbers within these spaces, we are going to figure out our score. So over here, I'm gonna get an eight, plus five, plus one, which is 14. Here, there's only two marks, so I get nothing in that one. Here I have three, so five, six, seven, eight points there. And the same thing for these. Here I'm getting all three of these. Here I'm getting nothing. And then the columns as well, right? So nothing here, there's only two marks in this one. But in this one I have that one, that one, and that one for 15 points. I'm going to add up all of these numbers, and I'm going to add up all of these and my grand total will go right there. Whoever has the highest total, of course, is the winner in the game. It seems to me like Yahtzee-style games are like a dime a dozen these days. You kick a rock, you're gonna get two Yahtzee-style games. You know, you have a handful of dice, you roll, you have two re-rolls, it's, all, it's all, always the same thing, too. It's like, it's mm -hmm. like deck-building games. You draw, it's usually six, you play, you discard your whole hand, you redraw, you shuffle when they're gone. That's what this feels like to me. And unfortunately, in this case, I don't feel like this one goes much further than it's a Yahtzee style game. It is. I think I really like Yahtzee style games as a mechanism, but I think I prefer them when you have to keep something from each role. So oh, okay. you're making that little <laughs> bit more decision. Um, and I think that's kind of what I wanted in this mechanism. You know, it's like you can roll three times. But it just doesn't quite have as much difficult decisions to make. You feel how lucky it is. A lot of times, roll and writes these kind of games, any dice games, of course they're lucky. We know that. Right. But this one, you really feel that, and it just hammers it home through the whole game. Yeah, a lot of these kinds of games give you that whole, oh, there's a little area over here where three times throughout the game you can mark a little X and something. something. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, sure, cute. Oh, thanks. That's sweet. Do I, I don't even use it half the time. I just, right. It's just nice that it's there if I need it and yeah. get in a jam. This game has no mitigation. On the one hand, that's good because I can teach this to pretty much just about anybody, barring a couple of weird rules. But, you know, if I teach it very carefully, then yeah, just about anybody can play. Mm -hmm. And if they're okay with luck, it'll be like, yeah, sure, woo, Yahtzee, you know. But on the other hand, it's so limiting. It's just like, really? Nothing? Look at that roll! <laughs> well, you know, it's just, it can be frustrating. I think that's the main, the main thing here is the frustration factor in this one can be very high yeah. if things just don't go your way. Right. And there's nothing you can do about that in this game, you know? Um, I find it very basic. I find it very simplistic. Um, the other thing is because, like many roll and rights in this day and age, they, f they have now figured out a way, they've found a way to give you something to do on other players' turns. 
surprised. Because there's, you know, Yahtzee with yeah. six, which people play Yahtzee with five and six. There's nothing to do while you're waiting. This play, this game here uh, uh, plays with up to four, and there's nothing to do on other people's turns. No, the turns are fairly quickly, but you have nothing to do. There's no planning, there's no, you know, like rarely they'll be like, oh, you completed that? Oh, I gotta cross some things out. That's it. That's not interaction. That's it's certainly not anything to do on other people's turns. Right, that's what, that's what I was going to say. If there is something to do on someone else's turn, then it's a negative thing against you. Yeah. And if it's a four-player game, that might happen two times before it's your turn again that you mark out two whole rows because right. or a column or whatever because somebody else gets them. And then you're like, uh, okay, you know, right. it just doesn't feel good that whole round. So I definitely don't think it's um, well-scaled to the higher player count. Right, that's my that's my thing there. Flip side of that, at mm -hmm. a two player game, you're looking at ten minutes. Yeah, you know, for so so you're saying it's very basic. I definitely agree with that. It is basic, but it's also has that high luck. But if you're going to have that high luck, keep it short, keep keep it punchy. If you can get over it, you you kind of alluded to a couple little rules, uh, hiccups. You know, that we had in learning it and the rule book not quite being as clear as I wanted. It's like as soon as you understand what it's saying, you go back, you're like, oh, okay, yeah, of course. Well, why didn't you just explain that a little differently? You well, know, give me it an needed example. Any... They needed a couple more examples right. in there, yeah. Yeah, and so they did that. But once you get past those hiccups, it is light, it's quick, um, and, you know, two player game, 10 minutes, three player game, 15 to 18 minutes, maybe, sure. you know, but it's, it's pretty quick. For me, it's a real average game. I didn't even mind playing it. I, I'm, I'm happy to play it. It's so slight. It's so. It's just not demanding. You know what I mean? Uh, I'm coming in at a nice, even average, five out of ten. It's fine. It's okay. I'm happy to play it with you. I will forget we played it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's one of those things for me. Um, I'm coming in very, very slightly higher at a 5.5. Because, um, again, same thing. I didn't mind it. I didn't dislike it. I, the, the frustration I might have felt with the rolls was so quick. I didn't have a problem playing it twice in a row. And right. that's kind of where I, games that are in this realm where I kind of rate it, is it something I'd want to play again afterward? And I think it did have enough. It was non offensive enough, I guess, yeah. you know, that like, sure, I'll play it a second time again. Um, as long as it's that lower player count, I don't th think it's going to blow anyone's socks off. It doesn't do anything like hugely unique or rare. It's just if this is kind of your interest, this little haha -ha game, it's a, a one trick kind of thing. You know, my friends come over who are also board gamers. Let's play this little, this little filler. Oh, you just bought your Calyx shelf. Let's play this thing about it, you know, and you have your, your 10 second laugh on it and you move on, right. you know? So it's, it's like you said, it's kind of forgettable um, for what it is, but also non-offensive. It's probably the best thing I can say. So 5.5 for me. Well, there you go. That is my shelf for the dice game of five, a 5.5. Uh, not a whole lot else to say about this one. Let's take a look at Kinfire Delve Vainglory's Grotto here, the first game in a, in a series of games, of which there's only one out so far. There's two more coming out in this series, and they are going to be compatible. You can take characters from this one, play them against the baddies in the other one. So this is based on the same world as Kinfire Chronicles, a much bigger game, and an evolving game world in which other games are even coming out in the future. Uh, this one is for one or two players. You can play solitaire, you can play a two-player cooperative. You are trying to take down this Vainglory character, uh, by playing cards, rolling dice, and succeeding at these various tests. Let's go ahead and take a look at it on the table. I'll give you a quick overview of how it, it all works. We'll come on back, tell you what we think of it. Here we're taking a look at a game set up for two players. The uh, players are each going to represent one of these characters. We've got Kor and Asha over here. This die represents their life total, and if it drops to zero, then they have lost the game. And they are trying to cooperate and go up against Vainglory here. Uh, in order to win, we have to uh, complete these challenges around them. They will be replenished as they are taken out from cards uh, uh, from this deck here. And once we run out that deck, then we have four special cards that show up. These four, which are set aside at the beginning of the game. Get through these, get through Vainglory, and on the other side of this is the main baddie. And then you win the whole thing. So the very first thing I decide is if I want to play a card. I don't have to, but if I want to, I can play one of these cards. So say I'm going up against a Guardian Beast. 
I could choose to play this uh, fearless card. It has three successes built into it. It's a red card and they match. And then it has one shield here on the side which ties to my special ability. It also has at the bottom here a special uh, text ability that says if I fail combat, I ignore the penalty. So actually if I don't succeed, which entails getting all the way up to eight hits, then I can ignore this penalty. Pretty good. So I'll play that. Next up, uh, this ability, or this total I should say, can be boosted. And if I'm playing Solitaire, I would do it myself from my own cards, but if I'm not playing Solitaire, which I'm not, then it must be from the other players. The other players can boost my card with this bottom stripe on their cards. If it's white, it ties to anything. If it is red, then it would be, uh, you know, helpful in this case. So let's say this player plays this card for me and discards it, and I get a plus two. So I'm now... I have a three right here, and I have this plus two at the bottom. They could boost twice, by the way, but let's say they're going to choose to do it just one time. My total is now five, and we go to the dice roll. And don't forget, playing a card and, and therefore you know being able to boost that card are both optionals. I could just start with rolling the dice. So now that I've got my five successes, I'm going to roll these, and I'm looking for red that matches this. I roll that. Let's re-roll that. Okay, there we go. So green and green, nothing. I get one more success from this, and this white face matches everything. So I've got two more successes, whereas this one matches nothing. And it will come into play with some other effects, of course. This dot has three fails and three successes. All right, so I got my three, my four, five from this boost, six and seven. I almost made it, but thankfully, this damage is going to stick around in this game, so I'm going to put 7, and because of my special ability, I will ignore this negative effect. I am done, I'll discard my card, and in this game, you do not automatically replenish your hand. In fact, if I want to replenish my hand, uh, I could choose to do that by becoming exhausted, and that means uh, at the beginning of my turn, I could do this, I would discard any cards I have left, if I have any left, I discard them, I then take one of these exhausted cards and deal with that ability, and then I replenish my hand back up to my hand total, and with two players, that would be seven cards. I would replenish back up to seven, and then I take a normal turn. That doesn't count as my turn, I still take a normal turn, but I do not just get to freely replenish my hand. So managing what you've got, managing when you boost another player is very important, which cards you're willing to give up to help them on their turn. The first thing that caught my eye with this one is just how gorgeously produced and illustrated this game is. Uh, there is just something very elegant about this mm -hmm. production, this game, and this world even. I'm not a big fantasy uh, person. I I find a lot of them sort of start blending into each other, fantasy yeah. settings and worlds. Um, I find this one a bit more captivating than others I've played in the past. And I will say right now, I've not played Kinfire Chronicles. It's I'm excited to, but I haven't played it yet. This one, I read the little blurb at the beginning of the rule book, and it was enough to kind of get me interested in the world, get me interested in this, this high fantasy setting, you know? Um... As far as the look of the cards, the components, the quality of everything, really nice. One of my complaints would be that the tokens in the game don't really fit particularly well back in the box. So the box is going to look something like this, with two decks of cards and the dice along the way. This bag of tokens here comes in a punch board that sits above it. Well, once you've punched it, it doesn't really fit back in very well. You'd have to sort of bag it and do your best to spread it out thinly across the top. That's a little unfortunate, but other than that, production-wise, thumbs up from me. Yeah, for sure. I'm there with you that I'm not a huge, I, I tend to prefer sci-fi over fantasy, yes. but just the color scheme here, it's kind of a, a minimalistic art style, but yet there's unique art on each one that really fits your individual mm -hmm. character. I'm also not a fan of gold foiling. 
99% of the time in games, on cards, that kind of stuff. It works so well in here. I feel like it's done in a very classy manner to elevate the cards rather than feeling heavy and gaudy. Yeah. You know, I really like some of those choices as well as the cards are very high quality. One of my favorite things, graphic design in the game, is just how clear it is to tell the colors apart. Uh, right off the bat, sometimes the blue looks like the green, but because they integrate the symbols for, I'm assuming for colorblind friendly, um, but even for those like me who are not colorblind, there's multiple times I'm using those because they're so well integrated into the game, on the card, on the dice, that I look for those just as much as I do the colors. Yeah, I agree. You know, and I really think that that's well done. It's so comfortable feeling and well integrated with the symbols and the colors that by turn two you forget about it. Yeah. And you're just moving forward with play and get to the to the puzzle of the game. Yeah, and speaking of the puzzle of the game, it can be a very puzzly experience with a lot of, if you're playing with uh, with two players, a lot of nice discussion that evolves from the game. The, the game is a fairly small, it's a, it's a small box, right? But it is also a fairly small game. But the game within it sort of belies that size. And I find it to be the hand management, which is very interesting. The which card you commit to what, and do you use it for the main part of the card or to boost somebody else's turn? Which card do you play when? Sometimes you want to sequence these things correctly or use the right card on the right challenge out there. Yeah, you quickly start having these little, like you said, puzzly moments of like, hmm, there's more here. It's This game is giving me more moments of pause and reflection than I would have expected from an 18-card deck and a central baddie, you know, sp splash there. It's very interesting. It's a really good mesh because it also has the dice there as well. Right. You know, and so it's a really good mesh of feeling puzzly, like you feel like you have to, in a two-player game, cooperate and feel clever. I can take out this guy probably on my own unless you want to boost it and guarantee it, or don't take that guy out because I need damage on him, but I can do extra if he has one. You know, so you have some great cooperative discussion. But yet you're still playing with dice and it'll have that little bit of swingy nature yes. that, oh, well, I'm glad you committed that card because I just decimated him. <laughs> you know, yeah, like I didn't right. need that. So it's enough swingy highs and lows and ups and downs and push your luck, not push your luck, but hope for the best and roll the dice. Yeah, it's a little push your luck. It does have, it allows, yeah, the game is puzzly and thinky while allowing for ha ha moments like right. I pulled that off or ooh, it was one short. That's great, those highs and lows. Yeah, those two mechanisms complement each other so well in this game yeah. to where you don't get head down. You know, if you're smart enough, you can beat the game. But it's not so wild with the luck either that it's like, I don't know, fate has already decided if we won or not. Yeah. You know, it's just such a good melt, melt of those two mechanisms, kind of competing mechanisms. I agree, I agree. Um, as far as the characters included in here, there, there's three things, basically. The main baddie in the center. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Some nice ideas there. Some great effects and, and powers on the cards. And then the two player characters uh, that the, the players will you know, bring to the table, which, again, you can play solitaire. They're very distinct. Very distinct. Mm -hmm. One of them is sort of sneaky, rogue-ish. Yeah. Um, has the ability to, you know, sort of, again, it's the character that's keeping damage out there because they get extra damage if somebody's already wounded. Mm -hmm. And then the other one, very defensive, very sort of tanky, defends against damage. Mm -hmm. um, they just play so differently. The cards, even though it is only, like I said, an 18-card deck, have so much personality to them. Absolutely. It's pretty amazing that they can, with just 18 cards, give you so much personality and interest in this game. Personality is such a good word for that because it feels like personality rather than asymmetry. It is asymmetry, but it doesn't feel like a mechanism. You yeah. know, it doesn't feel like, oh, I'm different than you. I have this rule. No, it feels like I am this character and I'm more agile. And so I'm bouncing over here. I take care of this, but it also takes care of these other three. Yeah. Or I take two off where the other character maybe can't do that. You know, they're more of a support character. I play this, but if it's on an obstacle, for example, I give more defense. So you really feel the personality of the Right. that come out. I think that's a really good way to put it. Yeah. Um, yeah, playing this game has, like I said, excited me for playing not just the 
Kinfire Chronicles, the much bigger sort of sibling to this game. But the upcoming Kinfire Delve games oh, with two new characters each and then a new main baddie. And you can sort of, again, mix and match those things. You play those two new characters against Vainglory here. Um, very exciting. It's It's a really neat concept that... I mean, if the second one is anywhere near as good as this one, I'll be very, very thrilled by that. One final thing I do want to mention is the game is also not a table hog. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it manages to... You can play even two-player in a fairly small space, and I like that too. Again, it manages to feel like a bigger world, a bigger feeling game than both this box and the table spread would lead you to believe. I love discovering games that do yeah. that. It's so rare, but it is so fascinating and fun. This is definitely like one that you could play at an airport or one yeah. that you could play at a Starbucks, something like that, but yeah. then still feel like you're getting a full game experience. You're not taking, it's more than just a deck of cards. Um, one thing that I, just, just one kind of, I don't even want to call it a negative, but kind of a holdback for me was the cadence of the game. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you felt, but it did feel like in the middle of all the plays was that little bit of, Wow, the well, we still saw, I'm sorry, that's the main deck that you're trying to run through to get to Vainglory here. Um, you're like, oh, I still have so much more of that to go through. But then next thing you know, you're taking seven off, you're taking six off, you're, you're really digging through that and discarding that deck to where right when you start to feel that a little bit like, uh, it's overstaying, it's welcome, hot on the heels of that is that end game final boss battle okay. of sorts. Okay. And so for me, it, it doesn't quite overstay it's welcome, but it's right on that line just for that middle section. But I think that that's well done in the end game is so different. Yeah. You know, where, where you go into that final phase um, trying to figure out how to get to the middle bad guy. Yeah, yeah. So there you go, folks. For me, this one's going to get an 8.5 out of 10. I think it is uh, fantastic. I really, really enjoy it. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't really have, besides, like I said, the insert with the tokens. Um, I, I'm having a hard time finding anything that I'm like, oh, I would have changed that. I think it's a very well done package. Yeah. I'm right there with you at 8.5. I wanted to go up to 9. Um, I can see this game for me even going up till 10. But what's holding it back just a little right now is I want more variability. Yeah. That being said, I think this box is enough on its own. You don't need to go search more. I think that it has so much variability in the box, but this gets me excited about everything to come that I want more. And so I think as I have four characters, when you get a second box, maybe six characters to choose from and really hone in on your favorite ones, that this will just shoot up for me or really find those bad guys and kind of those combinations, I can see it rising. Um, the variability in this box alone, if you're not like that and like to try all the different characters, I think is fantastic because that, that well that I spoke of that you're trying to go through, it's so well done that you have your completed cards which go out of rotation so right. you won't do them again, you know. But then you have the well as you as you complete those locations, you're discarding down. So I, I think it only, in the last game, I tried to make note of it, and we only went through and like saw about a third of the deck. A quarter right. to a third of the deck is all we saw. So you really have yeah. so much that you may encounter. You might have multiple mazes come out at once. You might sure. not. That might never hurt. You might never feel the pain of that. You know, you might get the perfect card combinations. You might be holding all cards that are going to help you on obstacles and no obstacles are out there. They're all right. puzzles, you know, things like that. So, so there's so many different things that can happen. So I don't say that and there's not variability here. There absolutely is. I think it's great, but I'm so excited about what's to come of this game and just having all those characters and trying the different combinations. I just, oh, I just, this makes me so happy. It's 8.5, and I'm ex I think it's going to rise, and I can't wait for it to rise. I just I just want more. Yeah, I'm right there with you. I'm right there with you. 8.5. Whoop! Excited. Uh, that is a seal of excellence, folks, for Kinfire Del Vainglory's Grotto. Uh, that's going to do it for this one. So that's going to do it, folks, for our three spinoffs here today. Tucana Builders, My Shelfie, The Dice Game, and uh, uh, Vainglory's Grotto there. Thank you very much for checking these out with us. Let us know in the comments if you've played these, if you like them, and what you think of spinoffs in general. Good thing, bad thing, something that excites you, not... Let us know in the comments, of course. And that's going to do it. My name is Z Garcia. And I'm Camilla. Take care, everybody. We'll see you on the next one. Hey, 
everybody, thanks for watching this video. If you like this review or whatever you just watched, wasn't it amazing? Uh, check out our channel, Dice Tower. Uh, we have all kinds of things. We review games, we do top tens, we play games live. It's all about board games, but especially the people who play them. Check out Dice Tower YouTube channel.